What's up, everybody? Happy March Madness to you. Hopefully, the fact that Tar Heels are not participating in March Madness has been dulled a little bit, and you've actually been able to enjoy some of the games this week. This is the Coast to Coast Podcast on InsideCarolina.com. I am Joey Powell. We are brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. All right. Thank you all for being here. However you're consuming the show, stop, rate, review us. We haven't had any reviews or ratings lately, so we really appreciate uh, the five-star love from you guys. Um, if you're not subscribed to the show, I'm not sure why you wouldn't be, but go ahead and, and, and beat that subscribe button down. I'll make sure you're getting all this content sent to you automatically on whichever platform you consume the show, whether it be on YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, whatever. We love that you're listening to us. We love that you're uh, you know picking up what we're putting down. We hope that you can get it automatically. As I said before, I'm Joey Powell, Inside Carolina's Coast to Coast Podcast. The two guys that you want to hear from are with me as always, Sean Moran, Cheryl McMillan. Boys, thanks for being here. I appreciate you guys jumping right in after the, I guess the uh, the Elite Eight has has completed. We now have a Final Four. After right. the ACC representing in I terms mean, of their look, strength. You can give me all of this, you know, Joe Lunardi, every Big 12 team is a quad one. The SEC is the most elite conference ever. The Big, team, big 10 needs every school to get in the, the big dance. None of them have made the Final Four, but the little old, you know, startup, plucky ACC sends veteran longtime member and basketball powerhouse Miami to Houston. All right, some of that I feel real about. Some of that's tongue-in-cheek, but yes, Sean, you're correct. Boys, uh, as we sat here and saw these games, and I want to go all the way back to the round of, of eight, um, not just the Final Four of FAU and, and UConn and Miami, and uh, and SDSU that are still standing. I want to talk about the eight themselves because what we've seen over these last few days of teams playing are some pretty obvious themes to me. I want to share these themes with you guys and have you guys elaborate a little bit and, and, and tell me how you feel that's, that's played out. What I'm seeing are four teams that are old, are very experienced, and have uh, a serious amount of toughness regardless of how you want to shape that. And they all also have a certain amount of transfers making heavy impact on the games. And that's not just the four that advance this weekend. Also with Kansas State and with Houston and with Creighton and some of these other teams, they all fit that bill too. So with that said, Sean, I'll come to you first because you, you know, you, you're farthest away from me. What's your, what's your reaction to that? How do you feel about that? And what, what does it say to you about the current college basketball landscape? Well, I think we all know the the college basketball landscape has completely changed. Uh, it's it's showing itself out right now with with a lot of the transfer transfers, whether it's um, Miami or some of the you know Kansas State, what we saw. But in terms of of what we're seeing on the on the floor, um, I mean, you're seeing you know go back to the the first 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 day of Michigan State versus Kansas State, which was. Uh, I didn't have it as a as one of the best games of the tournament, but it certainly certainly proved out that way. And you have you have point guard. I mean, Marquise, no, you know, Noel. His his uh his vision was was just incredible. Watching that and what that can do for a team. Um, but you really have five, you know, for the most part, four to five offensive threats. You have guys that can that are hit that can hit shots and are hitting shots from the outside. Uh, you know, that went from the Kansas State Michigan State game where they were shooting. 40 to 50% from three hitting big shots. Um, you know, even, even to the, just now the Miami, Miami, Texas game where Texas was hitting the shots in the, in the first half, uh, they cooled down and Miami, uh, you know, I, I think such a fun team to watch, uh, with, with some of their, some of the athletes they have, but also the skill sets with Isaiah Wong, et cetera, and they can create for themselves, but they, they shoot at a high percentage. And then you have Omir who knows his role. And does it so effectively? Um, so you really have just five guys plus bench guys playing in sync, and we didn't, you know, you can add UConn and, and everybody else who we just saw. So, you know, at, part of me wishes UNC had made it because I still think they could have done some done some damage. But at the same time, you just look at the the numbers and what their strengths and weaknesses were, and um, you know, you have teams that are just playing at a much higher level and much more competent uh, shooting the ball. We have talked many times on this podcast about our collective love, at least my my love for dogs. And I don't mean Spuds McKenzie. I don't mean, you know, Clifford the Big Red. I mean dudes that will rather run through you 
uh, to win than than to breathe. Sherelle, I want to ask you same question. What what is your what's your immediate takeaway from seeing the construction and the makeup of these teams that have advanced to Houston? Uh, I think it is a, a more pronounced version of what we've been seeing in the past. If you look at national champions since 2015, uh, when Duke won with uh, Jaleel Okafor and uh, Tyus Jones and Justice Winslow, three one-and-done freshmen, it's been all upperclassmen experienced teams, Villanova, UNC, Villanova, uh, UVA, COVID year, uh, Baylor, and Kansas. All those teams had you know depth and experience, um, and they were older, to your point. So I think what we're seeing now is teams are doubling down because they have guys who can play that fifth year. So there's a lot of COVID year guys who, who are back, uh, guys on their second and third teams, to your point, who are back. And I think they've learned uh, the importance of all this that <laughs> I guess it's, it's not promised because they're under third stop or, or uh, maybe they've been hardened more than others have who only, have only played at one school. But I, to your point, I think all that is is what we're seeing. It's just kind of uh, more intense because of, of the COVID year. Uh, San Diego State, we choked off and you know, they're it's a bunch of 26-year-old guys just playing ball who've been together for 12 years, like a national team, like a traveling AU team that went to college together. Um, prime, time, prime time players, San Diego yeah, version. <laughs> yeah, F- FAU, uh, combination of, of those transfers and experienced guys. Uh, same thing with uh, Miami, transfers and experienced guys. And then UConn is a really interesting blend of nailing the COVID class. Uh, they got Sonogo and Jordan Hawkins in the COVID class, which is amazing <laughs> considering what most people got. Uh, they have a couple of transfers and then they have a couple of talented freshmen. Um, so it's a good blend. Uh, but I, I don't know, man. It, it's it's interesting to me too because there are a lot of players who played at lower levels and this is hopefully taking the conversation towards UNC who people might have looked at their stats at that lower level and said, oh, he, he can't play in the Big East or he can't play in the Mountain West or he can't play in the ACC. And not only have they performed in March, but they've been among the best players in, in March and now as we head into April. So I think it is a um, it should be exciting for Carolina fans just because you can rebuild in a year. This this really is different, as we've said so many times before, than it used to be. You can completely change your team and identity uh, just in a few months, really, from March until September when practice starts. Thank you. This is kind of what I'm hoping to get to, um, I guess, to folks who are still kind of stuck on not feeling really great about the new the new transfer, I guess, feel the new landscape. Um, I, I understand that old habits can die hard, but I'm hoping that folks can recognize what has happened in this Final Four shows what can happen if you play the transfer portal recruiting and play your your high school recruiting properly. And so we talk about some recruiting. We talk about, you know, who North Carolina is going after in the portal. They got two pretty big recruits this past week um, in the sense that Armando Baycott and R.J. Davis have announced they're going to be returning to school. Why is that important? Well, think about everything we just said about older guys, experienced guys. But also, if you had to tell me to name two of the guys on the roster from North Carolina last year that had some toughness, it's probably these two players in Baycott and, and Davis. So, Sherelle, share a little bit about why those guys returning may help, uh, I guess, shape North Carolina into some of the results that we're seeing in this year's Final Four. Well, I think, the, in my opinion, the two most important positions in, in the game really are, are your big and your point guard. I think some people might push back on that and say, you know, really talented wings are the most important, but uh, I'll go with point guard and big still. So the fact that you have um, those two wrapped up, one who is an All-American, another who – has played at times over stretches for 10 or 15 games, like, uh, you know, first team all ACC performer, um, that is attractive when you go into the portal, as we've said, again, numerous times, to have those pieces already there, then you can really be selective in how you want to fill out the rest of the roster. And you can, again, it. I know people don't like it. It, it is free agency. It's what it is. So you can you can look at those two pieces and say, okay, how can I build next year's team to the best uh, of my ability around these two guys. And so I would think that uh, you want to add athleticism, as we talked about, and you want to add shooting uh, around these two guys because Armando Baker is going to get double teamed a lot. And if he doesn't get double teamed, then he's going to score a lot. And if he does, you need to have someone who can knock down open shots. So you say, naturally, need shooters. So they've started to look at shooters. And then you think about the 
the defensive prowess that they, they will lose from Leaky Black uh, being gone. You want to make some of that up with athleticism at the wing. And so I think they're kind of looking at that. So it, it's just, it, it is it is free agency and it is how can I construct this team for this particular season to be the best that it can possibly be. And having those two pieces back makes it very easy to kind of fill in around. Sean, what can those two guys do to improve themselves before next season from a just a, a player performance and a skill set level? Because I think one of the things that we saw this year was injuries aside, right? We know Baycott played most of the year hurt, and we know that R.J. Davis was not the same after being injured against Syracuse. But what can those two guys do that really nobody on the team did a great job of last year in making a an individual improvement from the prior season to this season? Yeah, well, you know, let's start with with Armando, who I think we we talked about it, where he, out out of all the players, probably at least maintained what he had done the year before. But, uh, you know, I think even just was watching uh, the the UCLA UNC highlights for the other day, and just watching some of the the ball movement and and how he was looking, it still seemed night and day almost. So, in terms of you know whether this, this happens or not, but would love to see just the ability to hit a ten to twelve foot a jump shot. Um, I think we saw him sophomore year knock down a handful of, of 16 to 18 foot ones. But even if if you're just able to to face up, you know, it doesn't have to be like Jalen Washington, but if, if he has that ability, then it's it's much harder for the double teams to come, uh, you know, when he's trying to back you down. And it, it just opens opens things up. I think for him coming back, he most likely, you know, his goal is probably to win ACC player of the year, given how close he's been the last two years. And that can eliminate some of those those games where maybe it is a, a seven foot defender or somebody tall and athletic or, or double teams that he's struggled with. Um, and then at the same time, uh, I think Sherell put it in one of his scoops, but the quote he had, you know, from the Charleston game of of you know being a janitor and and kind of really going going hard, being able to run the floor. We we saw it, you know, sparringly in, in the middle of the year, and that got him some easy easy baskets, but we we barely barely saw it over the the whole year um and you know injuries injuries happen um and and they're a part of the game but i think coming in 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 better shape and and a, a little 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 stronger a little more little light on his little more light on his feet i think can help uh help armando from a rj's perspective uh before he you know before that syracuse game he was playing lights out in the acc from a shooting perspective i think the issue with him, you know, is just the size and stature where teams will try to target him on crucial opportunities uh, if games are tight, which makes it hard if that's one of your leaders. But, you know, I love his his ability to defensive rebound uh, at, at 5'10 or, or whatever whatever height he's he's actually coming in at. But once again, seeing how a lot of these teams have been been playing, uh, the, one of the biggest issues was that assist to field goal percentage uh, or sorry, field goals made this year. And it's that vision, which uh, you, watching him in transition just <laughs> couldn't frustrate me more this, this past year, unless it was earlier and Seth Trimble had gotten out. But just the, the lack of, uh, you know, have we seen him throw alley-oop? I, I can't remember maybe when the <laughs> when the last time that happened. So I think just given he's coming back, uh, he needs to be able to, I think do a little better job controlling the the team and and getting other guys shots. We know he can get good shots. Um, we know he can make them, but almost returning to the sophomore year from a shooting perspective and and making sure other, others are involved and he's he's getting others easier looks. One of the ways that that North Carolina's program has always helped its players improve from year to year have been the uh, the notorious player pickup sessions that happened over the course of the summer. Um, and it's been something as long as I can remember where you've had former pros, current pros and current players all absolutely just going after each other during the summer, whether it be camp weeks or, or not, there's just, just a plethora of chances for the guys to go against real good competition and the games get heated. We've heard stories about, um, about certain players, you know, injuring other players, uh, going through each other's chest, those sorts of things, and just toughening players of the program up. So I want to go back to what we said earlier about seeing the Final Four now, showing teams that have a lot of toughness and a lot of experience, 
kind of carrying that over to last year's team coming into this year. And I want to pull a quote from uh, two faves of the modern era, at least in our lifetimes, of of North Carolina basketball, uh, Vince Carter and Antoine Jameson. Antoine uh, was on Vince's The VC Show, which is Vince's uh, podcast video show that that he does on a regular basis. Um, and they asked, you know, they were talking to to Antoine and, and Vince were sharing some stories about what they felt like happened with this team. Uh, Jameson said he felt like it was an IL. Uh, that was his, his instant response. And while I don't necessarily agree with that as the only reason, sure, you can you could say it was part of the reason because it was a new variable. But the big thing, I think, and this is what jumped out at me in his reply, was he was talking about that the 2022 and 23 Tar Heels did not have a, quote, feel for the game. And he was shocked at their practice schedule during uh, one of his trips to campus when he came and played ball with them. So I'm going to read a quote from this. A shout out to, uh, to Grant Hughes for pulling this for IC. Um, quote, the feel for the game is not there. Vince, remember all the open runs that we had. I went to Chapel Hill the first day they were able to play pickup. They played that day. And I told the team, I'll see you tomorrow. You're going to play tomorrow, right? They, they being this year's team, said, nah, we were scheduled to play next week. I was like, huh? And so it shows maybe a difference in now versus uh, the regularity with which those pickup games and those very heated pickup games were going on. Sherelle, I want to ask you, do you feel like there's something to that and maybe the, the change in whether it's real or perceived toughness of the current squad? And can having more of those competitions, uh, can that actually make this team better from year to year? I don't think it can hurt to have more of those competitions. Um, I think when you have a team like North Carolina who was finished on an amazing run and then is preseason number one and things don't go right, you try to find every possible explanation or solution when it just doesn't make sense. And I'm not going to tell you exactly the reason because I don't, I don't think I know. Um, Nobody but, does, man. It's all right. Yeah, but the, the simplest explanation does tend to be the right one, and this one doesn't seem that simple to me. Um, again, all due respect to Antoine Jameson and Vince Carter, who know more basketball than I ever will, forgotten, whatever cliche you want to use, but I, I, I kind of disagree with them. Um, the competition wouldn't have hurt, but I don't think I, – I don't see how that's a reason um, for what happened during the season. I think you have to look at more – basketball focused stuff like the fact that they shot 31 percent from three and that there were a lot of missed open shots and that Armando Baycott wasn't healthy the whole season and that uh you know Caleb Lowe wasn't as efficient as he wanted to be and that Larry uh, Pete Nance didn't have the season he wanted I think it's more so those things and I think everyone still and for a while will kind of grasp at anything and say oh that that makes sense that's that's a reason um so I don't think he's wrong but I don't think he's right either it would also be tough to prove but uh, you know again when, when this guy speaks, he does have his name in the front row of, the, of, of you know, retired jerseys. I think that matters. Sean, what's your, what's your reaction to what, uh, what, what Antoine said? Um, definitely have a, a few thoughts because uh, the past few days, I, I know there was a thread on it on the premium message boards, but uh, the premium archive message boards are a great, great black hole um, that, that are fun to go down. Usually I do it during live recruiting periods. And uh, especially as guys are becoming junior seniors, just kind of remembering who else UNC was watching at that time or, or how some of those guys came to get to UNC. Um, especially, and, and especially when you have a three month old or two and a half month old. Right? I was going <laughs> to say that, that screams yeah. of a guy. Yeah, yeah. That screams of a guy that's up at 2 AM for a feeding and has nothing else to do, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly uh, how it, how it transpired. I think from two to two to three the other day. So actually ended up going to the the pickup game reports and you know i know these are these are a thing i love reading reading them uh in terms of what happened uh, but i'd say over the years i probably i'll read them don't really pay that much you know that much attention to to how the games actually went but if you go back and, and read both pickup game report one and, and pickup game report two it actually i mean all the warning signs were were there, uh, which were brought wait, up, but wait, 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 wait. I want to, I want to point out that on this day of our <laughs> Lord, March the twenty sixth, Sean is now saying the signs were there on the pickup game reports of the summer. I love you for that, dude. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, so just here, here, pick up, pick up game number one. They got absolutely blasted. Um, and one thing there, you know, I, I don't know the answer to this. Maybe Sherelle does, but 
a lot of the guys you see coming back, obviously great, great Tar Heels are playing at the highest levels of overseas basketball, which is extremely competitive. Marcus Page, Luke May, et cetera. But you go down that list and you don't have NBA guys playing. You don't have Kobe. You don't have Henson, Barnes. Like, you, you, they're just, they weren't there. Um, you had Justin Jackson and Theo Pinson in the second one. Um, but once again, Theo's playing for the Maver- Mavericks, but he's not really getting any playing time. So you don't have the guys that are, are getting those, those minutes. It would, it would be great to see some of them come back in the future, but I, I don't know what the relationship is, anything like that. So getting back to on the court, first game they get blasted. Um, one anomaly was, was Dontre Styles going crazy, hitting four threes, but you had Armando um, play limited minutes, uh, whether that was injury or whatever it was, he played limited minutes, gave most of them to Shaver, I think had four points. Um, you had Leaky Black not playing, uh, whether that was injury. So right there you have you have, you know, two two guys not playing, they get blasted. I feel like it was oh four or or maybe Roy's first year or second year, um, that the, the current team got blasted and there was <laughs> they were they were called in or, or there was something that happened and they played much better the second time. This time around it was much closer the the, the second game, but you had Caleb Love um had a, a horrible shooting shooting day they weren't getting it inside the guards were struggling uh to penetrate and a lot when you read through the report there's a lot of issues that that came to surface so i think that all goes to what jameson and carter were saying and i don't think it was really nil i think it was just the run they went on most teams how 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 they lost giving up the 15 point lead having you know having a chance to get a rebound would put that desire or that burn in you but Having that three-week run was so amazing that they were pretty much celebrated as if they did win it. And I think they were fat and happy throughout the summer, which makes it hard to have that competitive desire. So I'm hoping with what happened this year, the pickup games are a lot different. There, there's a lot more competition. Um, and, I, and I'm going to be paying a lot closer attention <laughs> to the reports this year than I have in the past. Um, you know, and it's funny to read some of the comments of, of hey, if they had hit a few more threes, it would have been different. That's what we were saying, saying all year. Um, you know, so it was a it was a it was a good black hole to go down. But um, I'm going to be much more interested this year than I have been in the past. Trail, you got stories about uh about going down the the archived thread uh, thread <laughs> wormhole that Sean's been down. Oh, I'll, I'll give you one. It has nothing to do with this, but uh, it talks about a baby. Uh, so this is ex- almost six years ago when UNC was recruiting Cam Johnson. And uh, I was emailing with the Pittsburgh SID, trying to get information, trying to get a statement, trying to figure out what was going on. And it haunts me to this day because he sent me an email at like 4 p.m. And I didn't see it until like 2 a.m. when I was up during a feeding. And so <laughs> at 2 a.m. I'm on IC typing up that here's the statement from Pittsburgh. And I misspelled the SID's name. And he used to work at Duke and it I couldn't change it because uh, Jay Billis screenshotted it and it went out to the internet and I've always felt bad for that. So that's my 2 a.m. <laughs> premium uh, black hole story. But uh, Sean, I think <laughs> your point was really good about um, uh, uh, maybe about getting fat and happy. I think maybe Jameson chose NIL because that's like the thing now, but maybe what he was trying to say, and forgive me if I'm putting his words in his mouth, is that you know they they were a little fat and happy and they, they really enjoyed that three week run and everything that it brought them. And he's definitely not the only one who said that. Uh, I was talking to a parent of someone on the team last year and he was like, I just don't know if they understood what they were, what the assignment was. I know that's a cliche now that people use, but he was like, was it running it back? Was it, you know, trying to do what they did the last 21 games? Was it trying to run back the whole season? Cause like, cause the season was not great, you know, as a whole. Um, so I think maybe, the idea of run it back was like, okay, we'll run it back. <laughs> and they didn't understand the depths uh, that they were going to have to go to, to really get back there. If you listen to Justin Jackson mm-hmm. um, talk about after the the Villanova loss and, and what him and, and Kenny and Luke May did uh, as far as shooting and stuff, you listen to Raymond Felton when he talks about um, after they lost to Santa Clara and the practices before Maui and how they vowed it would never happen again. You just listen to those guys and it's very different. Um, as far as like title game losses and, and uh, losses to end the season, fueling the team the next year than what happened with this particular team. So I think 
maybe that's what Jamison was trying to capture, and he just said NIL because that's what you say now. Well, it's also it's it's a difference from when he played. It's a major difference from when he played. So it's it's easy to see that and and wonder what did it do to create, uh, you know, a different circumstance than what happened last time. Cheryl, something you just tapped into, and I think is really is really key, is that if this team did not understand what they were doing in 2021, 22 to get to the championship game, then obviously it would make sense that it would be hard for them to replicate it. If they could not understand in the moment what they were doing differently, then yeah, it's going to be hard for them to go back to that well. So it echoes kind of what you said, talking to a, a player's parent. And, and it echoes some of the things that we've heard, um, you know, both on and off the record, uh, former players that we've talked to and what they've said about just being being absolutely flabbergasted at, at the the energy and the effort and, and the detail uh, attentiveness from this team this year. Sean? So I, I think coming from that, the, the question stems, okay, if if now you saw what happened last year, you have Armando and RJ coming back, are they going to be the leaders? I think there was a, a lot of questions on where was the leadership this year? Um, and, and, you know, some some people do it, you know, some people do it by example. Other people are the the Rob Roy in your face type of guys. But who's going to be the one calling everybody together, getting them in the gym? Uh, who's going to be the one you know organizing things to make sure what happened this year didn't happen? You know, can it be RJ or Armando? I I hope so. But I think the question is it them um, is one. And then at the same time, you know, from the coaching staff, if you're hearing like if Vince Carter and Antoine Jameson are telling you. Hey, why why are these guys playing? It's also on them to, you know, ha- have to establish some of that authority and and some of those those bound you know boundaries and acceptable practices. So, I'm, I'm hoping with with what happened, uh, that you know, there've been quotes from Coach Davis to uh, Bubba, you know, everybody taking a look in the mirror, and and hopefully everybody is doing their part uh, to make things uh, better uh, coming coming very very soon last thing on this uh, michelle hillison who is like all everything at ic been around for a long time you might not know her but she does everything to keep ic together and she we and we point, love her but we do she made a point in um, the ic slack she was like it's kind of interesting that this year uh like you know last year was a ton of fanfare rightfully so with videos and very produced i'm coming back you know run it back return this year we have a tweet from rj davis which is like nine characters and we have uh armando baycott talking to jeff goodman saying i'm coming back um of the announced returns like kind of the higher profile ones um even some of the ones that hi- haven't been higher profile have just been you know retweets or tweets or or likes or, or something like that there's not the the show that was last year so maybe that is already showing a, a little bit of look in the mirror and understanding of, of what uh to quote that parent the assignment is this time I think one of the things that may explain why this team wasn't scrimmaging so much during the summer uh, as when Vince and Anton were here is I'm going to guess they were at Johnny T-shirt shopping. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at the different things that can lure you and distract, uh, distract you during the summertime in Chapel Hill, strolling down East Franklin Street into the little portal there and into Johnny T-shirt is certainly tops of that list, right? Like there's some other things in there like maybe – Maybe a dog at the drugstore across the street. You know, maybe you maybe you stop over on the quad and take your photo under the Davy Poplar, or whatever. But going to Johnny T-shirt is definitely tops of that list. And I would I would guess that after filling their bag uh, of burritos next door and then rolling into Johnny T-shirt, they're filling their bag of goodies from Johnny T. Because Johnny T-shirt has all of the best brands of Carolina swag that you can imagine. Uh, that goes from Columbia to Nike to Jordan Brand to Cutter and Buck. Uh, every single sport that you can think of, you know, if if uh, if North Carolina had a bass fishing team, if that was a real thing, Johnny T-shirt would have shirts for those. I mean, I, bass fishing is not a real sport uh, for college, um, and as somebody who's fished before in my life, I can say that. But uh, it's not a college sport. But if it was, Johnny T-shirt would have shirts for it. Just want you guys to take care of Johnny T-shirt. Go by and see him on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. Johnny T-shirt dot com. If you're a premium IC subscriber. Get the code off the message boards. Apply that to your purchase. It's an extra 10% off the top of your order. Save money. Thank Johnny T-Shirt. They're great people. Locally, alumni, owned and operated. Great folks. We love what they do for Inside Carolina. We want you guys 
to love them the same. Take a quick break. Let the national guys drop some ads. We're going to come back in and talk actual UNC portal stuff right when we get back. Stick around on the Coast to Coast podcast. All right. Thank you guys for being a part of the show tonight. Coast to Coast podcast from InsideCarolina.com. I'm Joey Powell. With me, as always, Sherelle McMillan, Sean Moran. Sherelle, we've talked as much about kind of what North Carolina is looking for in the portal. Man, I know you've been burning the midnight oil. Sean's been watching video. Sherelle's he's cheesing. He must have just gotten some news or something. But he's uh, <laughs> he's he's got that 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 ish eating grin on his face, like he just discovered something. Um, I know you've been working hard, man, and I know Sean's been watching all sorts of tapes so that we can give great analysis for these guys when they uh, when they pop on UNC's radar for for their portal needs. So, Sherelle, you want to give us some news about um, about Mr. Timberlake from Towson? We broke him down a little bit last week. Uh, we know that UNC went home with him. What can you tell us about maybe next steps there uh, for Mr. Timberlake as he is uh, as he is now taking his next step with that recruitment? Yeah, so he's scheduled to take a visit to North Carolina uh, this week. Um, and I think what's important to note is that a dead period starts on Thursday of this week. So um, if players want to visit North Carolina, um, if they want to you know, come see the campus and everything, they have until um, the 6th at noon, I'm sorry, to the 30th uh, at noon. And then they cannot take another visit um, really until uh, right before Easter. So it's uh, March 30th through April 6th is a dead period. You can have Easter weekend to go somewhere if you really want to. And then it's a dead period, April 10th through the 13th. Um, and then stuff starts back after that. So you're looking at really about, what, five or six days between now and April 14th when guys can take visits. So um, I think you'll you'll see a lot potentially uh, of names, you know, coming on campus, and, and Timberlake will be there this week. Um, again, a, a really good shooter uh, from Townsend. Um, another guy's using his his COVID year uh, to play an additional year of college basketball. A um, lot of high interest from a ton of schools. Um, pretty much every conference, I think, gotten some interest from. We know he's done some uh, in-home visits with other schools, but to our knowledge, North Carolina is the first visit that he set up. Um, Indiana, Kansas, LSU, Ohio State, UCLA, UConn, Clemson, Iowa State, Maryland, Memphis, a lot of schools want him. And it's just because of that shooting ability. And again, this is not complicated. North Carolina was historically bad last season shooting from three. And right now this is among, if not the best shooter in the portal. So just from a common sense logical standpoint, that's why you recruit someone uh, like Timberlake. So we'll see uh, what happens after his visit this week. Sean, I want you to give me some analysis. I know you've watched some Timberlake video, but I don't want you just telling me that, you know, when he shoots his follow through says, bye, bye, bye. What else do you have? <laughs> uh, so we should have a, a video coming out on, on Timberlake. I know we touched on him a fair amount last week, um, but was able to watch more, more full game uh, videos of him against Charleston, which was the, the semifinal game. And they held him held him in check. Uh, I'd say for the for the most part after he had dropped thirty four on them uh, to close out the the regular season. And you know I think for him we we talked about it. It's his his catch and shoot ability. Uh, he's pretty explosive, good lower body strength. So he gets he gets good uh, you know good elevation on the jump shots. And the one thing you do see uh, with Charleston. They shut down from the, they they kept him scoreless up until um, maybe two or three minutes in the first half and Towson, whether it's a baseline out of bounds play, they're running him through two to three screens, curling, you know, curling towards the basket or in the half court set, they're running him through elevator screens, running him from left to right, et cetera, to get him curling or open looks. And I think wherever he ends up next year, teams are going to have to do that uh, to make sure that, that he is uh, getting those, those open looks. But, if if he gets if he gets space, it's it's going down. Um, he had a pretty good game against Clemson. He did force some shots earlier in the year, but uh, catch and shoot, uh, pull up jump shots, I think should be utilized almost out of necessity if somebody closes out too quick and he's able to do that to get in the space in, in the paint because uh, he, he can definitely force force those. Um, not not great at finishing at the basket, but if he gets a step. And there's a you know there isn't a shot blocker in the way he can he can explode um, a lot more than more than you think. But I think for him, what you know proper expectation should be a guy that almost a better Joey Calcaterra from from UConn in terms of uh, 
ideally not starting, but depending on where he goes, if you're trying to compete for a championship, I'd say, you know, one of the first players off the bench that can come in, um, you know, potentially be a microwave off the bench defense. I could see teams trying to target and hunt him uh, until he proves that he can, he can guard, especially top shooting guards or, or wings. Uh, Cause he can, he can stay in front of you, but he doesn't have great length. So, uh, you know, teams, players can, can get shots, but the defense will determine how much he stays on the, on the floor. But I think his, his shot making will definitely make him a viable, um, you know, sixth man, seventh man off the bench that can go for, you know, maybe 10, 10 points a game, I, I would say next year. Um, and you look at Calcetera's stats, he, he played at San Diego. I got to see him in person as a freshman. You kind of say, oh, this guy, you know, he's, he's pretty good. I didn't see him playing for a final four team, but you look at his, you look, you look at his numbers. He didn't have an offensive rating over a hundred. He didn't shoot over 40% and you put him with some, some dudes and he's a shooter that can shoot. And now he's, he's shooting over 40%, very efficient. So once again, I think it's all who, who are you putting around him and what is that offensive system designed to do, um, to get him open looks and to, to get him utilizing his strengths. Shrill, what do you say to somebody who says, oh, that dude played at Towson. How good is he really? Yeah, I tell them to look at UConn. Their starting point guard played at ECU. Um, no disrespect to the Pirates fans who are listening, but that is not a program known for basketball. I tell them to look at the fact that there aren't any top 30 recruits in the Final Four. I tell them to look at San Diego State's entire team. I tell them the to look whole at squad, dude. The whole team who <laughs> are all senior. I look at the roster. There's one freshman on the roster. Yeah. It's like nine seniors, three juniors, and a freshman. Uh, I mean, those those dudes have been riding on the same bus since like 2017. I guarantee it. Yeah, so that that would be my response. And plus, he he's going to be he's older. You know, he graduated high school. <laughs> he graduated high school in 2017, so he's had time to remake his body to understand intricacies of basketball, uh, probably at a higher level than someone who may be more talented, but is 19 or 20. Um, and I, I think that's that's what I would say to them. Now, obviously, I think Carolina fans are, are a little leery of that, considering the superpower for this year's team was supposed to be that they were so experienced and they had so mm -hmm. much time. Uh, but I, that's what you look at. And if you watch the NCAA tournament, you see that it's not it's not Johnny Five Star who no. is, you know, winning games. It's twenty five year old three star who's transferred twice who's winning games. And Marquise Noel, who I I'm yeah. glad Sean missed him earlier. I love that dude. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's kind of where college basketball is. You know, the star player from Alabama and, and uh you know, his last game at Alabama was three for seventeen, three for eighteen. Um, couldn't do anything but against a bunch of guys who nobody wanted. So uh I, that would be our that would be my response. That it might not show up in game five or game 10 or game 20, but when it gets to tournament time, I do think older players are better and um, the goal is to win tournaments. Right. So that, that would be my response. All right, Cheryl, I want to, uh, I want to get you to mention the, the latest name that's kind of popped up on the radar and stopped by, uh, stopped by Chapel Hill this week. Uh, Pax and Wiljic folks may remember his last name, uh, but again, six, five, uh, 200 pounder, uh, wing player out of Brown and has played in the Smith Center before. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, again, I think he had a decent game in the Smith Center. Uh, Joey pointed out his Twitter profile picture. It was like him screaming on the Smith Center floor <laughs> after he yelled at somebody or something. Uh, but, yeah, he, he stopped. But we were able to confirm he stopped by campus on Sunday. Honestly, don't know a ton much beyond that, um, whether or not he, you know, was just visiting and in town, whether his family was with him. If it was an unofficial or an official visit, we, we don't have those details. We aren't sure what North Carolina is recruiting him for, how hard they're recruiting him, if they're recruiting him. So there's a lot of questions with that one that we hope to answer. And as soon as we find those answers or um, find more information, we'll, we'll put it on the premium board. But I think the biggest thing is that he, he was on campus on Sunday. Yeah, in that game against North Carolina two years ago, Pax and Wojcik had, uh, had 14 points, six boards, three assists in 36 minutes. Um, against the Tar Heels. Sean, you, you've seen a little bit of video on Wojcik too. Anything you want to share with us? Well, I feel most of that came in the first half when when Brown was up against UNC. And, I, you know, that was uh, my return to the Smith Center after many years of not, not being there. But I remember him, you know, he, he was playing well. He was in shots and he wasn't afraid to uh, talk back to the the fans who were who were giving him hell during the game. Um, 
you know, he, he really struggled uh, to end his junior season at, at Brown, uh, but he, he came back the senior year and uh, he transferred to Brown. He, he started at Loyola Chicago um, for two years and then transferred to Brown, but he, he very, had a very consistent Ivy League season. Uh, Cheryl mentioned in, in the article, second team, all Ivy League, but I think he went all of uh, January, February, and March um, scoring in double figures. So he was very consistent, uh, especially some some twenty point games. But you know, I'd say the athleticism is is the main question. I think from a a toughness perspective is there, and perhaps that is something that could be useful. Uh, once again, proper expectations, proper role, probably coming off the bench. But you know that that guy is not gonna, even if he's not the best player. That that's the type of type of guy that could be a leader or could be the one that gets gets everybody going. Um, but in terms of his game, he's, he can shoot the three, uh, shot 40% from three in the Ivy league play a little under 40% on the year, but he's a lefty loves to, loves to drive hard, uh, can pull up, get to the basket. He's not going to blow by anybody, but he's, he's, he's got good height, good strength. Um, and we'll definitely be interested to see where he, where he ends up. But, you know, his, his dad, Doug Wojcik, longtime coach, um, you know, for me, it's, it's kind of a fun fun story just because when I was eight or nine was going to Navy basketball camps and had his dad yelling at me for, you know, to get down lower in my, in my defensive stance when I was doing, doing drills and I've run into him. I actually ran into him, you know, when he was watching his son Paxson play on the Under Armour circuit years ago and, and when he's been and recruiting he, for Michigan state. And he well, told so. your, your stance was still garbage, didn't he? He did. That's, that's why I was, <laughs> yep. You know, not, oh, nothing man. changed, unfortunately, but, um, <laughs> You know, from a, a personality standpoint, when I first heard it, I was like, mm, "He's not from a from a talent perspective." I didn't. I'm not sure if what he can do at the UNC level, but from a personality standpoint, maybe that is the type of guy that you take as a grad transfer that comes in off the bench. But you know, he's <laughs> he's getting in everybody on a on a on a daily basis. So it'll be interesting just to see where where things go with the two of them. But we do know what Hubert likes to do, and that's really pit pit two guys against each other and and try to push you know push one uh to to commit we've seen that with transfers and recruiting um over the the last two years for sure Cheryl um something that we've we've kind of danced around here but uh being just the the pattern and the timeliness and the timeline of the way things have gone you know you see a bunch of guys leave the UNC program and then nobody's coming in and it's because of you know Guys just have to check things out. They want to visit. They want to talk to coaches and build relationships, et cetera, et cetera. But for fans who might see this and say, "Well, well, Timberlake's not a not a five star guy. He didn't have you know thirty points a game last year." Can you help us understand how North Carolina is going to look to fill these five roster spots? And you know, maybe the fact that not every guy is going to be an All American type, and the fact that they're all going to have different skill sets they bring to the table. Can you speak to that a little bit? Honestly, I think UNC is still figuring that out um, to some degree. They, they, they kind of. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, my examples have been so long lately. But like when you create a TV show, a lot of times they, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of times they, <laughs> a lot of times they. There's some, say, there's some Dick Wolf storytelling coming in right here. Go ahead. They'll say, "Well, I know that no matter how many seasons we have, I know that in season five, I know how the series is going to end because this is going to happen and this is going to happen." So they have it kind of plotted out. They just don't know how many seasons it's going to take to get there. So I think that's what the UNC staff is kind of doing. Like they kind of know in general what they want um, and kind of the pieces that they want. But, you know, if a certain player has one skill and he meets that need, then maybe they don't need player X who they were recruiting over here. So they go to player Y instead. So I think a lot of it can pivot based upon who they actually get. Um, and, you know, we'll again, we'll kind of see what happens. And the thing is like, this is kind of a, a marathon. Like it's a sprint to uh, have the meetings and figure out who's staying and who's going, but bringing them in is a little bit slower just because as we've talked about ad nauseum on here over the last two or three years, <clears throat> you don't want to fill all five of your spots by April 1st. And then, you know, Johnny five star who loved you in high school, but didn't get an offer says, Hey, I'm in the portal and I, I want to come this time. And then you, you filled up your five scholarships and you don't have room for them. Um, you know, Obviously, the Dawson Garcia signing didn't work out the way UNC wanted. But again, at the time, 
if you look at the plan, it was it was great the way it worked out because he entered the draft and entered the portal and then didn't make a decision until like June that he wasn't going to go into the draft and then waited another month. And the only reason that North Carolina has scholarships because they were patient and they didn't jump at everything that they saw in the portal immediately. So it's a nice balance of being aggressive with guys um, and saying, you know, we want you, we want you to visit, all that good stuff. But also, also, you know, kind of having your eye over your shoulder a little bit, seeing what else is coming into the portal. So they're trying to balance that. So, By the way, Sherelle, what is, hang on, Sean. Uh, Sherelle, what is, what is this pod's official stance on uh, player X versus Johnny Five Star? Uh, I, I like Johnny Five Star a little bit better. Um, he, as you would say, has that dog in him. Uh-huh. And uh, most of the time that I've seen him play, he's been okay. efficient. Feel like he's more of a more of a program fit too. I, I do. I do. Okay. All right. Good enough. Sean, what's up? Program fit. So you mentioned Dawson Garcia, and I, I do think that is a good example. Uh, and obviously, in hindsight, wasn't a great fit already taking taking Brady, but I think we alluded to that even as that was was happening. And I think that's what the one thing that UNC needs to be careful with right now. There's a lot of players transferring out uh, because you you brought in. You know, you had the freshman freshman class, sophomore class, and then you had the Iron Five that wasn't going to give up a lot of minutes. Um, in addition to how Coach Davis has has managed the team in, in terms of a bench, and now you still have some guys returning, Trimble, Washington, et cetera, um, that will most likely be coming off the bench. So you're going to add some key key starters. But I think once again, the best teams, and we're seeing that right now in the Final Four, the teams that are in the Elite Eight, Final Four, they're going. Kind of eight eight deep you know it's not there's not a lot of guys and i think you need to if you have 12 talented guys that creates a little bit of discomfort um slash maybe some lack of chemistry uh with people thinking they should be be playing versus if you're you have some defined roles uh and and i think that goes back to the dawson piece where you probably didn't need him when you got armando and, and brady um you maybe need a guy that is fine coming off the bench etc I think they need to be careful of of that, and just in terms of how they're shaping it. Even if somebody more talented does come up later, how does that fit from a chemistry standpoint, and how does that fit just trying to, you know, manage um, expectations, all the outside voices, et cetera, that UNC was dealing with this year. All right, Sean, you're going to get the last official question before we wrap this show, um, and mainly just because the host loves to force you into player comps, but. Um, if you could kind of give an example of what the perfect transfer portal signee for North Carolina would look like right <laughs> now. And again, it, there's plenty to pick from because they've got five gaps on the roster. So if you could kind of describe to our listeners and our viewers what that, uh, I guess, your prototype transfer portal signee right now would look like, who is it and, and, and what's your explanation behind it? Well, you, you made that a little easier than, than where I thought you were going of, of coming up with some other other transfer names, which uh, I'm happy to do next podcast, um, and you can you can hold me to that one. But in terms of positions, I'd say two, and these two guys are in the in the final four, so they won't be coming to UNC next year. But I think one uh, from Miami, you have you have Jordan Miller, who has always been in my mind the, that type of guy is a prototypical stretch four. Um, you know, six seven, maybe would have been a, a traditional three a while back, but. He can guard up, uh, but more importantly, he's catching the ball on the perimeter and attack off the dribble uh, and can shoot it and truly is stretching the floor uh, versus somebody that is a little more stationary uh, or maybe having trouble defensively guarding some of the, the quicker guys. So that type of player, that that, that six seven six eight, but a guy that can put it on the floor and shoot. And he then also, um, He also, Sean, I'm sorry to interrupt you. He did not miss a shot against Texas. Free throw, field goal, nothing. So I, I don't know who's keeping score at home, but to me, 100% seems pretty good. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not too bad. And it felt like he didn't miss in that second half against UNC uh, either. But the other guy, uh, Florida Atlantic, uh, John L. Davis, I mean, he, that guy, he is a, you know, Gary, Indi- Gary Indiana. Um, he is a just built like a tank, but he can shoot it as well. And he's kind of that, that junkyard dog that we've talked about, but he's got the the strength um, to to bully people, and he's got the athleticism to really get by people, create on his own. And when you're going up against him, forget that it's Florida Atlantic. He's going to have an athletic 
mismatch against the guy that he's guarding. And it's been, for the most part, a long time since UNC has been able to to say that. So if you're able to get, and it doesn't have to be at, at the two, it could be at the at the three, but if you're getting a guy that is kind of physically dominant but isn't a, an outside liability, sign him up. Um, and that, that's why you know I'm going to be rooting for a Miami-Florida Atlantic championship game so I can watch those two guys um, go at it. You're just a South Florida honk. Go ahead, Trill. <laughs> and to Sean's point, again, Jordan Miller did not start at Miami. He started at what we would consider a mid-major, George mm-hmm. Mason. So again, you know, just because someone is at George Mason or or Townsend or um, what's, what school do I always use? Siena or wherever they are, Siena. doesn't mean that they can't play basketball. It just means that um, maybe they didn't get you know, chance to play at a higher level school, or it means they got rapidly better over the course of their career. And Jordan Miller now did something to, like you said, Joey, it's only been done like once um, ever in the NCAA tournament um, today. So just keep that in mind when you're talking about guys who are playing at a lower level. Like Carolina is not too good to have some of these yeah. guys come in and play for them. They're not. Yeah. And, and to everybody who's listening, I mean, pay attention to what Sherelle and Sean are saying here. I mean, just because the Tar Heels are not in the Final Four doesn't mean there aren't things that you can kind of pay attention to and look at not necessarily some of the players themselves, but look at their skill sets, look at their traits, look at how they fit within the team, and look at what they bring to the floor. I think um, that might actually help as you're you're watching North Carolina go through this process. All right, and, boys, and, two and cents and time. There, well, there's no there's no Duke, there's no UVA, there's no Kansas, there's no Alabama. Um, you know, I, I think at least for me, those were the teams. I was rooting, rooting again. So, you know, the Big East. It's nice to see UConn back in the Big East. What, what, you know, it, it seems like yesterday I was watching Hurley at the City of Palms uh, Classic, storming up and down the the sidelines in in some of those games and what he's been he's put together. Although I think watching UConn uh, between myself and Terrell continuing to talk about the Jordan Hawkins uh, recruitment <laughs> or or lack thereof, just because that shooting stroke is is so pure um, and and what what he brings to the game. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think it'll be an interesting few weeks and it, it's already, already started, but you know, who can UNC bring in? And hopefully those are the pieces that can combine with RJ, uh, with Armando, with whoever else is returning. And next March we can talk, be talking about UNC, um, in these matchups versus, uh, another disappointing season. Yeah. Who knows? And, and these, all these final four teams are fun for different reasons. I mean, you guys mentioned, uh, you guys mentioned UConn. I mean, Sonogo's fun to watch. Real and I were talking before the show came on tonight. Like they're really, really balanced. And I mean, know, I don't know if San Diego State's fun to watch, but they're tough and they win. They're tough. So. <laughs> they're, they're like if if you like to watch some brawlers, those dudes are some brawlers. Um, and they don't back down from nothing. But uh, Cheryl, got anything for our, our, our two cents before we get out of here? No, I'm just mad with how today went. So you, if you want to enjoy San Diego State and whatever that is, the basketball that, that, San, Diego, <laughs> that San Diego State plays, you know, cool. It's look, I, I, man. It's, this, it's Tony. Is, Tony oh, Bennett forgot, Ball forgot, with bigger dudes. I forgot Creighton in that list of teams. UNC and, fans would probably be rooting against. No, and, no. Hang on, Shrill. I'm going to save you here for a second. Okay. All right. There's very few people listening to this show that are going to be sad for Creighton, and we understand. Um, but to your point, Shrill, they're actually a fun watch this year. If you can, if you can take the name off the jersey, they're a fun watch. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I just I, this final four. I'm going to hate watch it just because <laughs> I, I, I don't know, just. Outside of UConn, just the style of basketball, like, just it's just not there. Like, I know people like rooting for it's Miami, different. but I, I don't care about the ACC outside of Carolina. So I, 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 mean, I know I, everybody else does, but it's just, I don't know. I want, I, I am a give, give me, give me the Lakers and the Celtics in the finals yeah. every year. I want big brands, big names. I don't like, I don't like Cinderella, and maybe this because I grew up, you know, in the no, Carolina the, family the, and going to Carolina. But uh, I would much prefer last year's Final Four. The Even if Carolina engine, wasn't in it. Yeah, the little engine that could story is great for the lead up. But then when the game comes, you want to see <laughs> you want to see haymakers, you want to see heavyweights. And um I, I think that's that's understandable, Shrill. I I think it's absolutely understandable. And you know, you don't want to see um you're not gonna see the the smooth uh final four because as we've said all year, I don't think anybody in, in college basketball this year was really any good. You didn't have those marquee teams. And the ones that were assigned to be marquee teams turned out to be uh, not great tournament squads. And Sean, I mean, to, to your point earlier, I'm not even, I'm not even bat, you know, rah, rah Miami. It's not that I love Miami. I just like to, to, to throw a, a two finger salute to, to the guys that touted the big 10 and the, the SEC and the big 12 all year. Go ahead, dude. 
Yeah, well, I didn't even touch on the, the Big Ten, but we, we know my, <laughs> my feelings towards towards that. Uh, I mean, yeah, to Shell's point, I don't think we want a VCU Butler uh, Final Four and then a UConn Butler Championship type game. Uh, but I do think, you know, UConn Miami should be pretty pretty high level and. You know, Florida Atlantic, I kept thought they were going to fold against Kansas State, just given what Noel was doing and some of the shots they were hitting. And they just, they kept coming back and coming back. So, you know, they're they're a tough team, well coached. Uh, but, you know, we'll we'll see. And and once again, I'm I'm just glad the teams I mentioned are not are not in it. So we'll be watching Davis and and Miller, and uh, you know, rooting for those Florida schools. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, sure I'll talk about hate watching. At least North Carolina fans can hate watch for different reasons, right? You can hate watch because of the style of basketball that's there, not because you're you're hate watching certain schools or certain coaches or, or whatever. Boys, anything else you want to add before we get out of here? All right. Seeing two heads shake no real hard. I appreciate it. <laughs> we didn't know how long the show was going to be, and we almost made a full hour out of it. So I'm I'm thankful for you guys contributing what you bring every week. Uh, shout out to those folks who tuned in and listened tonight. We're we're glad for you guys for for stopping by. I hope you continue to do so. Special thanks to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring, to John Siegley for producing. But until next time, for Sean Moran, for Cheryl McMillan, I'm just Joey Powell. This has been Coast to Coast Podcast on InsideCarolina.com. We will talk to you guys very, very soon.